started. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our first Zoom call featuring one of our medical advisory board members to share some of the amazing research underway for cool and debris syndrome. Also, a big hello to all of you that are watching us via Facebook. We really appreciate you all tuning in live as well to hear about this awesome research. We're just really uh, grateful that you've taken this time to spend with us and I'm just really excited to share with you. Just a couple of introductions first before we dive into the meat of our talk today. I am Casey and I'm going to be your host today on behalf of the Cool and Debris Syndrome Foundation. I am a very proud mom to Hudson, who is nine years old and was diagnosed with Cool and Debris Syndrome three years ago. I am just really honored uh, to share the Zoom screen today with Dr. Neil Kasri, a group leader and assistant professor of neurobiology at Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. We are meeting today um, with a huge thank you to the Cool and Debris Syndrome Foundation for pulling all of this together and their unwavering commitment to educate, increase awareness, and promote research for the support and enrichment of individuals living with PDBS and their families. Thank you so much for making this possible today. If you want to learn more today after the call about the foundation and some of the additional research that we are supporting, you can visit kdbsfoundation.org. I wanna walk you through just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, thank you again for submitting so many incredible questions ahead of the webinar. We were just blown away by how many of you submitted them. They were really fantastic questions. We did our very best today to group them into themes and answer as many as possible that are specific to Dr. Kazri's area of expertise in research. For those that were unable just to get to on this call, um, please know that we'll be certain to circle up with you after. And we have more of these calls coming in the future that I really do believe will address many of the questions that were asked that we may not be able to get to today. Um, the call is also being recorded. And so we will be sharing the link with you after today's uh, webinar, and we will be making it available through email as well as on social media. Lastly, I did want to let you know we are hoping we'll be able to take some questions at the end, but of course that is time permitting and we really want to try to get through many of the questions that were submitted to us ahead of the call. There is a Q&A button or a feature at the bottom of your screen where you're able to ask your questions and, and like I said, we'll just do our best to answer. If you can't, we'll try to circle up with you afterwards and point you in the right direction. Before we get to our questioning with Dr. Kazri, one of the things that we thought would be really helpful is to just very, very briefly in just a couple of minutes, really introduce you to cool and debris syndrome. Um, we know that some of you who may be joining us today are very early in your journey of discovery. And so we wanted to give you a little bit of information to provide some background and some context to a lot of the research that we're going to discuss today. Cool and debris syndrome was first identified in 2006 and is named after Dr. David Coolin and Dr. Bert DeVries. It is a genetic syndrome involving the 17th chromosome and is actually caused by a micro deletion or by a change or mutation of the candle one gene. The micro deletion or the mutation causes developmental delays, learning difficulties, and can cause other health concerns as well. The prevalence of the micro deletion is now estimated at one in 55,000 individuals. Due to a limited number of identified Candle 1 mutations, at this time, the prevalence of the mutation cannot be determined as more research is required. Researchers continue to collect and analyze medical data, and in the future, they will be able to develop disease management and surveillance strategies. You can learn more again by visiting the Foundation website. So, speaking of research, let's get to know Dr. Kazri. Hi, Dr. Kazri. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you're welcome. Nice to be here. I'm really honored. And I see that there are many participants, so it's, I'm quite uh, surprised already to see so many people. Uh, so I hope I'll, I'll be able to elucidate a little bit today. Yeah. Oh, I know you will. And I, I can confidently say I don't think I've ever been on Zoom with someone so far away before. So it's, it's pretty awesome to be here in the United States and talking to you in the Netherlands. So. I'm so glad we can make it work in terms of the time difference. Um, so I, I thought today it might be helpful for everyone watching to just start with the basics. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us what it means to be a neurobiologist and what originally drew you to this field of study? 
Yeah, so, so for me, what it means to be a neurobiologist is, is, is trying to understand, I think a, a question that many of us have is try to understand how the brain works. If you think about it, it, it it's, you know, it's such a complex organ um, and we know so little about it. Uh, and it, it's amazing that we as humans can do what we can do. And, and trying to understand that, that, that has been something I've been, you know, it's, it's kind of a curiosity that has attracted me since, uh, since I was little. Uh, so that, that's really the reason why I became a neurobiologist, I think. And, and also, if you look at, at pictures of, a, of, a, of, a, of the brain, but also of the cells, of the brain cells, they are so beautiful that <laughs> complex but beautiful and somehow I got fascinated by it um, it's hard to explain why I have this passion but um, yeah that's so how I, it's can, I can confidently say on behalf of everyone watching that we're very happy and thankful that you have that passion and have, have gone into this field of study because I know the work that you're doing is going to um, just really benefit our loved ones immensely uh, so getting away for just one question from science and research, can you tell everyone watching just a couple of fun facts about yourself? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, maybe maybe it's good to know that I'm, um, I, I think I, I'm a very international person. For example, I was born in Luxembourg, I, I, uh, but I, I lived all my life in Belgium. So it's very nice by, my father was from Morocco. My f mother was from Belgium. And I met my wife in South Africa. Uh, our child, our, our daughter was born in New York. Wow. And now we live in the Netherlands. And my wife is Japanese. So, you know, this is, uh, I think, a very in, in, we are a very international um, family. And we have very good memories from, uh, from, from our time in, in the US. So, uh, so that's it. As a Belgian, I do love chocolates, but I don't like beer. So that's uh, huh. something, yeah. And um, one of my favorite hobbies is to play with boomerangs. So, you know, the stick that comes, when you throw it, it just comes back. That's just, you know, maybe one of the less obvious hobbies that I have. And uh, yeah. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Um, how did you first become involved with Dr. Coolen and Dr. DeVries and first learn about Poulin-Debris syndrome. Yeah, I actually vividly remember it. It was at a conference that we had in, in Greece and we were sitting uh, outside. And although we were working in the same uh, department and, and our university department is very large, it's about 300 people. I actually first met David Colin um, in a, at a conference in Greece and we were having a little drink and I still remember that he told me that, uh, you know, we just discovered this disorder, we know, but we know so little about, would you be interested in, in, in collaborating and, and knowing more about it? And that's where it started. Wow. Uh, so he somehow convinced me to, that it was interesting. And uh, well, now we are about almost 10 years later and uh, here we are, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, when, when they first approached me and just first started talking about and kind of becoming interested, did they kind of tell you up front what it was they wanted you to uncover and what they were hoping that your area of expertise could help them learn? Yes, certainly. So the, at that time, they uncovered the gene, eh, the cancer one gene, mm -hmm. uh, but, but we, we knew very little about it. So we, we basically, and, and no, I hope now 10 years later, we know a bit more, but we still uh, lack some knowledge. But... Uh, that was the question. It was like, um, we found this gene, we know it's responsible for the disorder, but we don't know what it does in the normal brain. And, and then I thought, well, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there, you know, that's, that's how we embarked on, on, this, on this project. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And you all are, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you all are located in the same medical center, correct? Yeah. So how yeah. are you all able to stay connected with one another? Because I know there's a handful of people that are working on fluid degrees research. How do you all stay connected on a regular basis about what you're learning? Yeah, well, so the, for us, the, the fact that we are in the same department is, of course, a, a big advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, uh, Dr. Berthe Vries uh, is joining uh, our lab uh, meetings every Friday morning. 
so he's so he's is there so I, I get we get to share our our data discuss our new our progress uh so that makes it very easy and then of course uh well before the covid 19 time we were meeting at conferences very often now we do it via zoom but that's how we communicate and try to share and try to to, to you know, share expertise and try to get other people interested in um, in cold the V syndrome, uh, but but yeah, that's that's. I think we are very fortunate to 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 work in the same department of David Cole and Alberto V. So it makes it very easy for us. Right, yeah. Absolutely, and and I know too with the with the um, Cole and V syndrome foundation as a medical advisory board, and I understand that you all have an opportunity to connect as well. Yeah, so that you can hear kind of extended work that's going on from others that aren't right there in your department. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so kind of pivoting into my next question. Um, so last year, uh, our family actually went to Utah um, to the Patient Advocacy Summit and had an opportunity to meet many of you. It was just such an educational experience. But I think for our family and probably many of the families that are watching that were either in Utah or in Asheville, um, we had the very proud moment of my son Hudson and my husband Matt actually giving skin samples. Yeah. And, um, you know, that even though we're going to learn a lot more, I know about that today, and, and I, I'm not sure we actually knew for sure what they were going to, but we thought, you know, this is, this is really cool to know that we get to be a part of as families um, contributing these, these stem cells that you all can actually use to learn more about, about the brain. Um, so I, I really thought that was super cool. And um, we got a ton of questions ahead of the webinar, people just fascinated by the work with, with stem cells. So um, can you tell us, you know, why do you need these samples and, and, how, and how do you actually turn those into brain cells? And I know that starts to get into your work, but. Yeah. Um, well, so, so it, it, it all comes down that we want to know what's happening in the brain eh? or what's, what's going differently in the cold of uh, patient brain or not. But we also know that we cannot just go into you into the kids' brains and start messing around and and look at what's happening. So so what we we are trying to do is like having the brain cells in a dish so that we can study them without of obviously affecting the children directly. Mm -hmm. And 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 about 15 years ago there was this amazing amazing invention um, where they made it possible that you take a piece of, of skin or you take even blood or hair and you can, uh, from those cells, you can make uh, what we call stem cells. The stem cells are, are it, it, it's like the origin of life. So everything starts with um, when an egg is fertilized, it basically produces stem cells. And those stem cells, they can become any cells that you want. Uh, but in addition, and so since we are interested in the brain, we, we just generate brain cells from them. Wow. And this allows us to, to study, of course, now the brain cells um, that originally actually the material started from, from, from your kids. And the big advantage is that um, these, these brain cells, they have now have exactly the same uh, genetic information as the, the, the kids. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the question that comes up very often is that, is there a difference between the micro deletion and uh, the cancer one mutation only? Mm -hmm. So now we can compare this, right? Because now we have brain cells from, from kids with the micro deletions and brain cells with kids from, with the mutation. And, and that's, that's, that's the fascinating part. And, and that's, that's why we need you, why we need um, the participation of you as a, as, as a parent and, and a kid. So that it makes us, you know, it allows us to make the those brain cells and study them. Is there anything specific? Because that was a question um, that we would have maybe gotten to later. But the one of the parents did ask: Is there anything so far that you are learning in your research where you're where there's a difference or that's presenting itself between the deletion and the mutation? Yeah. So that's a that's something that we initially we 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 did not compare them, uh, but now we since we received. Uh, quite some samples from you that this is in the planning, I must say. At this moment, how we compared it, we, we compared um, four, uh, so four samples from uh, patients with, with the cancer one mutation, and but only one with the micro deletion. So 
we see subtle differences, mm -hmm. but we at this moment it, it's a bit difficult to say whether it's really because of the deletion or, or not. But we are planning and we're hoping to, to do this in the, in the coming year to really compare larger numbers so that, um, that we, 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 whether there is a difference or not. Of course, uh, David Cohen and Bert Vries always tell me that as, as clinically there is not a difference, uh, but it still might mean that there is, uh, if you look more in detail at the cells, there might be some, some differences that, that at some point might be relevant. So um, at this moment, I can't say anything about it. And, and the short answer is we don't see a major difference. Actually, we see surprisingly the same. Um, but I think it, 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 since we have all the material now, we will be able to, to answer this question more in detail very soon, I think. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely. Really awesome. Yeah. Um, so I know you have um, the ability to share with our audience here um, your screen and some visuals yeah. that might help uh, really make it easier to understand some of the research you're doing because it's a little, I'm going to be honest, as, as I was trying to look through it, it's kind of complicated, but it's, it's fascinating. And so I know everyone's going to be very excited to learn about it and probably have a ton of questions. Um, but I think at this point, I'd love for you to just walk us through um, the research, you know, the, the various studies and, and really what you're trying to accomplish by doing them and what you're learning. And um, I may stop you along the way just to clarify a little bit, but, um, but I'll, I'll let you start kind of speaking to what, what those studies yeah. are. So, so I prepared a few uh, slides. And so it's a very short form of the presentation I gave uh, at the meeting last time. Uh, just to, to, to it makes it easier to talk when uh, and you see some figures, I think. Great so, uh, so I'm sharing my screen. I, I hope that you all can see this. Yeah. yeah? Okay. So uh, first of all, I absolutely want to thank the, the Col de Vries uh, Foundation because uh, it only thanks then, then to generous gifts and support that we, are, we, we have been able to, to do this research over the past years. And, and they, if we summarize them, we can, we, we can summarize them in, in three little aspects. And I, I'll just, those are three vignettes that I just want to touch upon very quickly today, uh, because I think um, otherwise we'll, we would be, be a few, a few uh, hours. Um, and uh, so, so let's get started with the, with the first vignette. So you all heard from, uh, from Casey, Casey that, that the, the uh, the cause of the of the of the disorder is is caused by mutation in the cancer one gene or the micro deletion. Huh? So one aspect of the of the studies that we do is trying to understand what this gene is actually doing. What what is the function of it? Because we don't know it very well. And and for that, I just want to illustrate with something, and I hope it makes sense. But I think it's fascinating. So if we think about uh, every cell we have in our body. So if you just take a skin cell, something you cannot see actually, we know there is a genetic code in this in each of those cells. And you know, if you take it out of the, of the cell and you will just wrap it, you would just spread it out. This would have the length of about two meters, which is um, six feet or something. In, <laughs> in, so it's, it's about the length of, a, of an adult person. So in every cell we have DNA so the genetic code is, is about two meters, long, which is, is really long. So a very basic question is how does something that is so long can be packed in a single cell? And, and, and nature has found a very, uh, very elegant way to do it. And um, I just want to walk you through very quickly to it, but the, the, simp the, the, the idea is very simple is Basically, you have to wrap around the DNA around uh, a little ball here, as you see here in green. So the DNA with the genetic code is literally wrapped around this green structure here. And if you wrap it around enough, you can actually pack this two meter long or six feet long uh, molecule of, of, of uh, DNA into one cell. And what, what we and others found is that cancer one, the function of it is, is important to uh, pack this DNA around this 
green um, structures here. And so uh, what, what's interesting, if, if you have this, this protein, it will, it will basically allow um, that your DNA is being, is being read so that, that you can read the DNA. And so if we lack cancel one now, we, we actually cannot read the DNA anymore. And, and that's, that's of course has, has, has a, a lot of consequences for the function of the cell. So that's one aspect that, that we, uh, what we call is a molecular study. So it's, it's a profound study of the, of the cancel one gene. And now this, this is saying something about the gene, but it does not say about something about how the uh, brain cells function. And, and that's the, the, the second uh, study that uh, type of study we, we do. And, and that those are those the brain cells that I just mentioned, where we start with uh, skin cells from uh, your kids, and then we can make stem cells from them. And then from those stem cells, we can generate uh, the brain cells. And, um, you know, I, I told you in the beginning, I, th I think they are beautiful cells. Well, you know, this is how they look like. And yeah, yeah. I think you will agree with me that they are very spectacular cells uh, in the sense that they have those very long uh, structures. Uh, and so they're very complex. Mm -hmm. And so what we can do is we really can now grow those um, or we can generate uh, those cells, those brain cells, either from what we call the healthy, uh, healthy population. So we received also uh, some cells from, uh, from the parents. So we're also very grateful to the, from the parents because now we can compare, for example, the brain cells from the parents with the brain cells from, the, from your children. And that's how we do that. And we can look at many things, but one important thing is that brain cells, they need to communicate with each other. And, and that, that's something we can do by, by growing those cells on what we call smart dishes. And those dishes, they have these electrodes and they can sense all the electric activity that uh, the, the, the brain cells, how they communicate with each other. And that's, that's always an image that I, want, I like to show because here, every time you see a color here, it basically tells you that those brain cells are communicating with each other. And that through, of course, very complicated uh, uh, analysis that we do, uh, we can basically can tell you when, when brain cells are talking, how often they are talking, with who they are talking, and how loud they are talking. And so it's just like Facebook, you know, uh, you, you're just, you, you, you basically can, can you know, near, uh, brain cells, they like to have a lot of friends and they like to communicate a lot. And so we can actually uh, watch or, or listen to their communication. So that's, that's the second uh, 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 aspect that we are doing. And so what we found, and I think if I want to summarize it a little bit, um, this many years of research, we found that um, normally brain cells, they, 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 they generate some waste like all of us do. And you all know that, you know, to keep your house somehow functioning, you also need to clean up the waste. <laughs> and there is a tight balance between cleaning up your house and, and producing waste. And, and what we find is that in that those brain cells in, in Col de Vries uh, patients, somehow they produce a lot of waste that cannot be cleaned up. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, it, it's like a little bit this cartoon you you will function less efficiently and and so this is what we found now so now we have to find a way how to get, get rid of this waste <laughs> and 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 now we we are working on this very hard and then we we have some initial uh, ideas about this and um, but this is i think the simplified way of how we uh, could uh, i think um, uh, show it um, so, so this is this, this um, but I, I'm just going to answer what I'm going to guess everyone is thinking right now mm -hmm. is you said you have some ideas yeah how to get rid of it so is there anything yeah. regarding that that you can share with us yeah so that I think we, we shared it last time as well already so um, so what we found is that we produce some waste and this waste in in it can actually 
some, in some conditions being cleaned up by the use of certain types of uh, what we call antioxidants. And antioxidants you might know as vitamins. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that's something that, that we have some good results with uh, on, on those brain cells, but they are in a dish. And that's, that's where I always want to be careful. So uh, those studies in a dish allow us to do a lot of experiments and to manipulate and to find this type of uh, you know, findings. However, of course, those brain cells in the dish, they are not your, your brains in, in, you know, they are not a real brain. And, and this actually brings me to the, the last type of studies what we do, and we have been, been uh, also supported for this by the foundation, is that we want to bring this knowledge to uh, uh, an, an in, what we call an in vivo animal model, eh, where we can study the whole brain as, as such. And, and, and that's what we are doing now. So, um, uh, and we do that with my little mice. <laughs> and uh, so we can look at the behavior of those little mice. And, and that's, I think, um, an, an advantage. And um, of course, the question that we always get is how can we, you, our finding of basic research at, at the end lead to some uh, medications or some, something that would aid? And this, is, this is a little bit the process that we need to go through. Um, so we need to do the basic research, and I think we have done this now, and we need to find certain um, a targets uh, like those vitamins that could be potentially interesting. Um, and, and that's now, we are now here at this stage where we have to test this in, in, in mice. And that's what we are currently doing. And, um, and, and of, of course, we hope that, that we can show that what we find also in the, in the, in the little dish, we can also find in the mouse. And, and for that, we are, we are tracking those little mice. And I think that's always a nice little movie. But, but here you see four mice. And we, we can basically, you can see this is all done with computers. We can see how they interact with each other. And we know that, that, that uh, the, called the cool kids, they are very social, right? They're extremely social. And we also see that with the mice. So the, the mice that have the same mutation at the, as the cool kids, they are also very social. Wow. And, and so now we can look whether um, we can um, change the behavior to the more uh, controlled mice, uh, for example, by uh, giving them this kind of vitamins. Interesting. So yeah, this is, got, if I can stop you for just one second, we, we got a lot of questions about that around just the supplements and vitamins. And, um, you know, if, if you believe that the research will get us to a point where we can like very definitively say this particular type of supplement or, um, so I guess how, how granular do you feel like the research can get us in terms of answers of like exactly what type of, of drug or supplement would work? Yeah, so so in principle, we will we should be able to uh, to 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 get an, to an answer to this. Um, uh, the the only thing that is is that is that we we know that this always takes time. So uh, and and that's that's always where we are very very, you know, it's always this balance between uh, being excited about a finding and then and then not not immediately jumping too many steps. And so far as really now the, 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 the importance is really to, to say, or let's try to, to, to also confirm this in a, in a whole brain, let's say. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, but if that works, then, then we can try to, to, to translate that to humans, of course. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is no, never a guarantee that this also works in humans because humans are very particular. <laughs> they are very special species. <laughs> um, and, 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 and that's, that's something where we can never say that it will work ultimately. Um, um, and and that, that's, of course, I know that people want to hear something else always and, 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 and you know, like some um, definite answer. I, we cannot do that. We can only give hope, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so th th that, that is a trajectory that we have to do, to take. So we cannot cut corners. We have to go through this, a, a stage by stage and then uh, every stage takes time um, but but yeah there is, that's the only way forward mm -hmm. so um, we are already positive that we can we now found uh, 
certain uh, ways to to ameliorate, let's say, the functioning of the brain cells. So let's let's take this now the next step and 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 try to confirm this in in animal models. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like I think and and from what you're you're saying, there's definitely I think we can all feel really excited about the hope that you have found ways to learn and yeah. to get the information that you need to kind of take the next step in your research and. Um, I, and I think maybe one of my clarifying questions too is when we talk about increasing function, um, you know, so, so if there were a drug therapy or there were supplements or something that could improve function, what does that mean in your mind in terms of, of function? Yeah, so the, so the way, the way so the, of course, um, we, we have, uh, so a, a, a cell, like I said, um, if it produces too much too much waste, mm -hmm. then it will not be as efficient in in, in functioning. And by by that I mean the way they communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. our, our brain cells communicate with each other. The the reality, of course, and the difficulty with with these um, with 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 uh, these disorders, of course, is that that it starts from from the moment that the brain is developing. Okay? So you you have a developing brain. And, and already very early on, already in utero, the brain, brain cells will start communicating with each other. So if you have, of course, 10 years of miscommunication between the brain cells, um, the question is really, can you really completely um, yeah, uh, solve that problem uh, at that moment? Or should you, or, or is it already too late? Mm -hmm. and, and that's something, of course, that, that in general with developmental disorders is, is an issue. Um, and, and, but, but yeah, there is, there is only one way to go forward and then is at some point to try and, and to see what will work. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, you, everybody can probably kind of think about it, that it, it's, it's probably more beneficial if you can treat someone very early on mm -hmm. than later on. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but but this is that this is all what we can also we can try to also mimic that try to test this with mice for example, uh, with mice we can try to treat them either very early on or or later in life and then see what would be the most beneficial. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And and one of, one of the other questions we got quite a bit was around you know kind of going back to function and sort of what does that mean and when. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, just in general, talking about the syndrome, you know, a lot of these individuals, whether it's um, developmental delay or a number of health concerns, like th there's a lot of kind of commonalities to different things that these individuals experience. And so have you all been able to identify any specifics around, you know, because of the too much trash, so to speak, or lack of function that increases seizures or that impacts yeah. developmental delay or has there been any direct correlation with any of that just yet yeah so that's 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 a very good question um and and that's actually something that we that i would like that we would like to do more with with the mouse uh model because there we can really look at seizures for example or at the cognitive because yeah you have to measure cognition then of course um what you're asking is a bit maybe the chicken and the egg uh, <laughs> question. Eh? So what is now leading to to what? Um, it, it, it's it's what we believe is that the the the, the type of of uh, less functioning and so the less communication that this um, at, at some point can lead to also to the epilepsy that we see. Uh, that that sounds of course maybe counterintuitive. Uh, you say because epilepsy that's actually typically a dis disease of of of, of you have at some point too much communication, um, but we believe that that this is actually the start of this of this process. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, because that that and we're kind of already kind of jumping into parent questions because a lot of them are relative to a lot of the things you've been saying. But um, I, that's another question we got a lot is just you know I think everyone kind of has on their mind. Um, you know, there's certainly the part about just the the function of the cells in general and how the brain functions, yeah. but then also. Um, and, you know, as many of us as our children are getting older, um, gosh, what can, what can we learn that we can actually treat? And so yeah. I'm curious kind of in terms of, of treatment options, your thoughts there. And then of course, we got a lot of specific questions around um, in terms of treatment as we start to learn what drugs may work, um, you yeah. know, will there be an opportunity to learn that this is the best drug for growth deficiency or seizures or kind yeah. of, of these other health concerns? Yeah. 
So this is this is another aspect uh, almost. That, so this is actually how can we um, how can we deal with the symptoms? Uh, so how can we, um, for example, seizures or well, and and that's that is something that that um, that probably yeah that that is a quite difficult. Uh, that 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 question you almost have to ask back to reason and David Cole because they are really the clinicians. I would say. Um, we are trying to more understanding the developmental aspects, so to really try to see how how you how do you come to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but realistically, and that's that's the reality, of course, for for many uh, for all the parents here at this moment, you, you are dealing more already with the with the facts, uh, kids that are ten or older and that have the seizures, and 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 then then it's 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 a little bit try and error at this moment. Um, your 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 physis, physician or clinician will say, well, we can try this or this um, drug to prevent the, the seizures. Also, the difficulty is that um, probably this is this is very individually based because we also know that not all kids have the same. So not all the cool kids at ten years old present with exactly the same manifestation, and so. Um, the way I look at it is that at, at the beginning stage, all the kids probably have the same um, uh, uh, developmental um, dysfunctioning, let's say. Yeah, that, that, uh, but, but as you grow, your brain tries to adapt to, to this and, and that might diverge. So, that, so that, that's why uh, not, yeah, kids are a bit different uh, like we all are, of course. Uh, and and they might also react differently to uh, certain um, uh, drugs that, that are given. Um, but I think that that's where sharing the information amongst you know amongst uh, the community, of course, is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, and and I think also from the clinician side is of course recognize the syndrome as as early as possible. Uh, getting the diagnose as early as possible is, is of course, uh, very important because then you learn more about the progression of the disorder. And I think that many questions are probably also uh, around that theme, like how, how will my kids uh, develop? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that, unfortunately, the disorder, will, will, uh, we will have still have new cases, let's say, in the coming years and, and for the rest of our life, but they will benefit enormously from, from the information that has been gathered systematically now, for example, by the clinicians that are working on it um, at, at, uh, at, at every level. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Casey. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's very helpful because, I mean, I, I think, you know, again, we just, we all think as parents, you know, what, what are the things, whether it's to your point, addressing some of those clinical concerns and some of those symptoms that many of, many of these cool individuals are facing and have yeah. been for a while. So it's always a trial and error to try to figure yeah. out what are the very best drugs that are going to help. And some do and some don't. And like yeah. your points it can be very different among the individuals, but I think we're all looking for what's the best thing for our kiddos. And then I also think there's, um, as you mentioned, in terms of just like the, the mental function and the development, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're probably all hoping for how do we, what can we learn in the research where we can help our individuals we love um, opter, operate at kind of their optimal kind of cool and degrees capacity, right? And so, mm -hmm. It sounds like there's a lot you're already learning in the research, but it also sounds like there's there's a lot more you need to learn. Absolutely. To get to that point and to be able to answer those types of questions. Yeah, really, and, and that that's I think one of my my really wish is that much more many more researchers would be working um, on on cold disease uh, because then we would advance it much faster. Um, then, then, uh, because all, every of these questions is, is, is are separate research studies, and I know it's so extremely frustrating that we, as researchers, we always say that it takes time, but that's the reality. Unless we would have hundred people working uh, only on this, um, but this is not the case, and um, so uh, that, that's that's I think the only thing we can do is try to do more and more, uh, understanding more and more. Um, we also work on other disorders, and and it, it's a little bit the same uh, there. Uh, but yeah, sometimes just because of history, uh, uh, some other disorders are, are a little bit further already 
than 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 call the V's. Uh, but we also learn from them sometimes and uh, so things that have not worked, uh, or um, we see commonalities between uh, certain uh, some some aspects. For example, this epilepsy is something that that you see very often in developmental disorders. Mm -hmm. So we can try to learn also from 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 them. Um, and that's especially, I think the clinicians are the strongest in there because David Cole and Alberto Vries, they see many kids and not only the cool kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they, they probably are, their experience is, is extremely valuable in that, in trying to, uh, to advance the, the field. And I think also the, the fact that we have a registry now, I think where we try to, to really keep track of all the information from the kids eh, and that, that I think it's, it's extremely helpful to to, to learn um, about it, yeah. Yes, and that's a, that's a very good point. I think if all of us can continue to spread awareness about how important it is to, to, and even though it's a lot of questions and it takes a lot of time to input the information, but continuing to put anything we learn about our children in that registry, I know that that it's, is very yeah. helpful to the research. Absolutely, yeah, because we have to do it because the only way, uh, so it, it is a rare disorder. So we don't have, uh, luckily we are, you, you are well organized and, and, and so that, that really helps. Uh, but in, in terms of numbers, it's still, it's still relatively low. So we, we need, it's really great if everyone can participate and, and bring in their... Uh, and I yeah. think that's, um, that's the, the genida.org, yeah. I believe. But we'll make sure for all of you watching that when we send out our follow-up email and we post to social media, that we'll include that link so that if you haven't participated in that registry, you're able to do so. Because that's very, very valuable for for yes, research. Um, Dr. Kazri, I have a couple more questions that came in last night I just really wanted to get to. And um, I know we had said we wanted to keep it around 45, but I also see we have a couple in Q&A. So we may just try to take a couple of those real quick too um, before we close. But there were a lot of questions um, and I tried to just group them into themes, mm -hmm. but around um, CRISPR gene editing, gene therapy, yeah. gene replacement, DNA transplantation, um, kind of back to what are possible treatments that you yeah. can I think this is an extremely exciting uh, field and, and uh, it's great to see that you're all up to, up to date. And maybe you have heard that the Nobel Prize uh, this year was given to the, to the people who, who discovered uh, the CRISPR. Uh, and, and, and basically, what it allows us is the CRISPR allows us to, to repair um, the, the, the mistakes that, were, that, that originate in the DNA, in our genome, that are the, the initial culprits of, of the disorder. Uh, and th the best way I can, I can explain this is that um, every of us have two copies of the, of the cancel one gene. And in each of so in each of the, the in the cool kids case, then there is one copy is not working anymore. Right? We call that a mutation. So what we are trying to do now is to see whether the the healthy one that is still there, whether we can boost it, if we can give it a bit more, that it 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 will produce more protein, so that it can compensate for the one that is not working. And 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 therefore our, our brain cells in addition are fantastic. Um, uh, because we can just do that in a, it's not so complicated. So we, we can we can use those tools. So that's um, absolutely something that we are are, are looking at, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and that's that's a general thing that is for many of the developmental disorders uh, people are looking at this. And there are promising results for other disorders. We have not yet done it for Condovis, but the in theory we should be able to do this uh, to to design uh, strategies. That's incredible. And I know you said timeline, like you can't, you can't make promises around timeline or anything like that, which, but I'm just curious. I mean, just, if, and not even maybe specific to our syndrome, but just of what you've seen in others, when you get into this kind of new, new way of being able to, to yeah. think, I guess, how yeah. long does something like that discovery work take before you would get to a human trial or any type of therapy? Well, um, it, it, it's really depending case per case, I have to say, but I, I Maybe you have heard of this of this of this uh, case of a disorder which we call SMA, okay. um, and uh, it, it, it's it's in a way it, the, the strategy was very similar. So you have one um, uh, copy is not functioning and the other copy is still functioning, and somehow we they found ways to to inter to 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 help this one copy that is working to it. And this is one uh, that, that, that went 
really relatively fast in 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 um, in helping the the children, and this is something that that is now there was one example uh, where they went you know from from the research to the patient, but it was literally one patient, so um, um, it, it, within one year they they, they could do that. Uh, but but it was because this patient had a very particular mutation. So that it we we call this extremely personalized uh, medicine. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, and and so with that, I don't want to say that we can do that now for colon disease. But what 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 it does tell us that this genetic approaches um, are, are really a very plausible or very uh, concrete way to uh, to interfere. And and I think this is really one part of the of the, of the the future for research is to, to focus on that part. Of course, the brain remains a very difficult to access structure. And so you still have to get all the, the manipulations within the brain, uh, but there are also ways around that. But, but yeah, we have really seen this, 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 um, this, this progress over the past few years, which is extremely hopeful. And, and it's not a coincidence that, that the CRISPR, the people that, that invented CRISPR received the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. um, uh, very quickly after their discovery, actually, because it means that it, it, it will have a, a big impact. Very um, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very, and, and a couple other things that I wanted to just make sure we covered, because again, these were people who submitted ahead of the call. Um, and then Ashley, we'll, we'll let you give us a couple of quick questions. But um, just two other, if you can just address really briefly two other treatment options. Um, one was... IVIG infusion related projects, if there's anything that you've heard that may be impactful in this, um, for, for this syndrome, and then also um, plasticity as well. So can you speak to those briefly and if there, there's any thoughts that you have there? Yeah, so for the, for the first one, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say much. I don't know to, that I'm not aware there was anything going on. Okay. On the plasticity, it's, that's always interesting. I think that, that comes down is can you, can you actually if you put it very simple, if, if the brain cells are not functioning, can you can you help can you help it by 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 stimulating it more? Let's say, um, I, I think it's an interesting concept, um, and and for us in the research, I think it's it's difficult to 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 say anything. I think it's it's that that you as parents probably have more uh, um, experience in the sense that that. And there is a lot of behavioral therapy and, and some kids had, had, had the chance to go to more extensive behavioral therapy, which, which might be, which, which showed to be very beneficial. So I, I certainly think that there is an aspect of that, 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 that can ameliorate. I don't think that it will always completely get, you know, miraculously, um, uh, let's say cure, uh, but, but there is always a win, uh, a, a certain, uh, um, Aspect that you can win there by 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 probably increasing plasticity in, in, in all kinds of ways. Yeah, absolutely. I believe that. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I, everyone, I know we're at, at 50 minutes and we we appreciate you hanging with us. Like I said, you have had so many great questions. It's almost it's impossible to get through all of them. Um, and we will do our best to follow up. But Ashley, um, if, if everyone can hang with us a few more minutes, Ashley, I'd love to open the line to you. And if there's a couple of questions that you could, could bring to Dr. Kowski that he could briefly speak to, I think that would be very valuable. Yes, the question that came up was about the antioxidants and what antioxidants you're studying and maybe what families could do um, themselves if they could increase antioxidants with their KDVS individuals or your thoughts on that? Yeah, so so that's that's uh, the, the 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 difficulty now with antioxidants is to um, to there are many different antioxidants. So that that's that's first of all uh, one thing. So we are trying to see now which ones are the most efficient ones. Um, normally, uh, well, we all know that uh, you know vitamins are good. <laughs> Uh, and uh, probably many of you take vitamin supplements, uh, but but in principle, if if you have a healthy diet, you you should get the um, enough vit vitamins, and, and it's not something that you can. So, from the moment you have a certain amount of vitamins, then everything you get you 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 take extra is actually not really being taken up by the by the body. Um, 
So that's that's a bit the difficulties of, of vitamins that you cannot just say, oh, now I'm going to take, I'm going to uh, give my kids a, a lot of vitamins because that, that the body will not, will just not absorb it. So we need to try to find ways to, um, with, 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 you know, kind of a, let's say, um, uh, ways to still increase the amount of antioxidants, but but this will probably not just go by taking up vitamins. So that this will probably be a more complex um, way. But there is a whole field of research that is that is kind of almost only studying these antioxidants. And I think the step that we have done now that we know what we should look at is to actually work with the people that are specialists in the antioxidants. Uh, at this moment. You know, I, I can't really tell you, uh, and I know this is a very logical question that 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 you will have is like, should I just give more vitamins to my 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 child? And and I, I you know, there's probably nothing wrong in doing that, but, but there is don't don't expect that suddenly. So it, it it won't be that simple. So that that's my message. So it it's um um it it will be a bit more complex than than that. I'm afraid, but I think we have the we now have pinpointed where we should look at, and and now the, the step is really to try to to make that next step. Um, hence, also there are studies with the animal, uh, uh, the mouse models. Yeah. Ashley, do you have a, one of one or two more that are that are we can have them briefly answer that are queued up? Yes. The final question would be. Do you feel that your research and your antioxidants would be able to impact? infants as well as adults? Um, very good question. That's exactly what we are trying to answer now with the mice, uh, mouse studies, because there we can, we can um, give it very early on. So a very when, when, they are, when the, the mice are just born, let's say, or even in, in utero versus adult mice. And so we will, we will, we will know then. I can't, and, and I know that I think this is a very important experiment um because this will this, this would if you would then translate it to humans of course this this would be exactly answering that question yeah so i i definitely think that our research will make that impact and that that's why we absolutely have to do this this research um uh yeah so that's that's uh i'm affirmative on that <laughs> wonderful yeah. Okay, so that that is all the time we have. I, I don't know about you all, but it feels like that went really fast. Um, it went and, really fast, yeah. Gosh, and, Dr. Casbury, yeah. we are so thankful um, that you have joined us today and for your incredible work and your commitment to research that we know is is just making so much progress um, for colon debris syndrome. So truly, we're just grateful and really appreciate you taking time to join us and, and talk through all this great work that you're doing. Um, I know that there were some questions that we just couldn't get to again today and just want to really thank you all for um, your interest and your participation. Um, as a foundation, we plan to have more of these events in the future. There really is some tremendous research going on um, that I think will really help answer um, many of these questions and we'll do our best to connect with those of you that we, we couldn't get to today and point you to the right people and the right resources. Um, please take a moment to fill out the survey. This is our first one, so we think it pops up when you leave the chat. Um, if not, we would, we would welcome any of your feedback to help us plan for the future. Um, and lastly, to learn more about Cool and Debris Syndrome, the research, and how you personally can get more involved with our organization, um, please go to the foundation's website, which is kdbsfoundation.org. We look forward to connecting with each of you all again soon. Thanks so much and goodbye.